Welcome to Keep the Game Beautiful podcast. Each week, I highlight incredible people who are doing amazing things in soccer, the beautiful game. I'm Anna Turi, your host. Thank you for listening. I'm really excited to be starting season two off with Vince's episode, and I think this is just a perfect way to start it off. We just wrapped up season one last week, where my dad and I kind of switched the roles, and he interviewed me instead of me interviewing him. And that was a lot of fun, and I think that could almost be a tradition where after every season, we kind of do that and just recap the season or maybe just talk about what's going on in our personal lives or in the game that I'm playing or whatever. Vince is someone that I've really wanted to start off season two with. Over the past few months, he's been someone that's really been keeping the game fresh and keeping people involved and coming out with new coaching education and different courses. It was really fun to see him instruct at a course, it was maybe six months ago or a, a decent while ago, and the webinars that him and Ian did, especially today, we learned a bit more about what came into doing those. It was very fun to be on it. I love just talking about my story. I hope you enjoyed the episode today because this was a very fun conversation with Vince. Today's guest is Vince Gansberg. Vince has many years of coaching experience at all different levels. He holds the USSF A license and has many years of coach education under his belt. He is currently the United Soccer Coaches Education Content Coordinator and continues to give back the game in so many different ways. So Vince, is there anything else you'd like to add to your bio? No, I think you've covered it. So I appreciate the opportunity to be on. Thank you. On this podcast, I always start with the same three questions. First, what does the beautiful game mean to you? Uh, well, the beautiful game means a lot to me because without it, I don't know where my path in life would have ended. Um, I was very fortunate in my life to have come across some amazing people because of the game. Uh, my first club coach was a guy by the name of Dr. Alan Kettner, uh, who saw something in a kid that lived in a trailer park and came out and worked hard. And uh, he ended up calling a college coach and got me an opportunity to play in college. That led to me meeting, uh, eventually playing in college and, you know, pers- uh, basically realizing that dream of playing college soccer. And then I ended up being a teacher, but because of that college experience, I stayed where I graduated from, which is near South Bend, Indiana. I ended up meeting a guy by the name of Mike Berticelli, who was the former University of Notre Dame uh, men's soccer coach. And from there, he told me to take a coaching course. So I took a coaching course and I guess you would say the rest is history. So I've had, because of the game, Um, I've had just wonderful experiences that I honestly, I don't think I would have ever received if if it wasn't because of it. I've been, I've traveled around the world. I've educated coaches in you know, the Caribbean and Scotland and um, yeah, I've just been some great, um, just great places that I don't think had I just, you know, uh, stayed a teacher. I don't know if I would ever, receive those. So, but I'm very blessed. And this game has given me a lot. What are actions or things you do to keep the game beautiful? My actions hopefully is when I design curriculum and content for our courses, that the content and curriculum is more about the whys of coaching as opposed to what to coach. More about the importance of a youth coach to a child as opposed to what to teach the child. So how do they, how should they interact? How should they, uh, you know, uh, control themselves when, you know, things aren't going well in practice. Um, the idea of saying like saying yes to S's, right. Safety skills, smile and sweat. Um, 
as a coach, right? So those actions I put in our curriculum and hopefully the coaches read it and uh, act upon it and that they're constantly reminded. So uh, as a coaching educator, that's what I hope my actions do is that I convey the message that really it's not about you as a coach, but it's about the child that you're trying to help, right? And you coach them. And uh, it's not about your win and loss record or anything like that. So. How do you encourage others to keep the game beautiful? Uh, I, hopefully through my actions and hopefully through, hopefully I, I walk the walk, right? When I present and I um, kind of, I basically I, I model a behavior that, that, um, I want coaches to do right when they're with their kids. So every time I teach a coaching course and hopefully, um, you know, I model the actions that they should model right when, when they're with kids. And so I hopefully encourage others just by being positive, uh, you know, with the kids and also when they're actually learning how to coach, right. Being positive with them too. So tell them that, you know, just to you know, keep learning and keep going. And, and again, don't worry about the X's and O's necessarily right now. Mainly worry about the whys of, of coaching. Why are you there? So at the beginning, you kind of gave us a background of why you started coaching. Growing up, did you always see coaching as an option for yourself? I don't know. I, th I think when I was in fifth grade, yeah, I, I would like organize leagues in the street, you know, so... I guess I kind of saw myself being a teacher in some way, shape or form. I never thought it would end up being this like a full-time coaching educator. I always envisioned myself being a teacher, um, but uh, really not much being a full-time coach, if you will. So um, it just kind of happened, you know, and, and uh, not to sound corny or anything, but, but God had a plan for me and he still does. And, you know, I, uh, you know, every time I, something happens, right? There's something that says, Vince, you need to stay here or you need to do, you need to go here. And so I never thought, I never envisioned when I was younger about your age, right? That I'd end up being a coaching educator the rest of my life. I just never did. So it just happened. Could you tell us some of your favorite memories through your coaching journey? Oh, wow. That's a lot. Um, yeah, I think, you know, all the high school teams that I've coached, um, you know, I'm speaking as a coach, right? So I was primarily a high school coach. Uh, just some, you know, there, there was, you know, I had one team that won a Northern Indiana State Championship, you know, but then I had, after that, I went and I started a brand new soccer program. And these kids, like some of them had never even seen a soccer ball. So I went from coaching a state championship to coaching a brand new program. And um, I think that was those seven or eight years building that program was one of the, the most rewarding years. And the, the years that I grew more as a coach because I really had to teach and I really had to be patient and say, look, it, it is about the process and, um, and now, you know, it's a, it's a program that's you know in good shape and, and I left it hopefully in that way. Um, but as far as being a high school coach, just all the kids that, you know, uh, years later they want to, you know, they, they asked me to be their friend on Facebook, you know, that's like a big compliment, you know, that, uh, that they didn't hate me so much that, uh, they still want to kind of keep in contact with me. So, um, you know, and I coached a wonderful girls high school team uh, as well. And, um, you know, saw that program grow and get better. And I just think, you know, as a coach, you have a wonderful opportunity to just change kids' lives, you know, and I think those are the experiences that I remember the most. You know, there are some great, sure, there are games that I remember and games that I would not like to remember, but I still do. Um, um, but uh, as far as a coach goes, you know, and then also I was a youth coach for my son. You know, until he was about 11 years old, I, I gave him to a new coach when he started talking back. So, um, but when I 
uh, coached his team. And, you know, now those kids are now grown adults and now we're friends and it's just, yeah, it's just what, what coaching should be, you know, and um, it should just be a, a lifelong journey where you hopefully you impact people positively along the way. So what led you to build that program right, like you were talking about from the ground up? Well, I was a Catholic high school and teacher and, you know, at the Catholic high school. And back then, the Catholic high schools, uh, the pay was very minimum. It, you, I had to coach three sports, work at Sam's Club. And also, I was a night auditor at, at the Signature Inn, I remember, just to make ends meet. And uh, so I... I had a very successful run at the Catholic high school. We just won the Northern Indiana state championship. I coached again the next year and taught there at the same high school, but then an opportunity at a public high school opened up. I was young. I was trying to raise a family and it was a $10,000 increase in pay. Right. So I couldn't turn that down for my family. Um, while at first, maybe the motivation was not necessarily an increase in pay, but, um, just, you know, when you're in a public school at that time, the benefits were better. Everything was a little bit better, um, than what I was receiving at the Catholic or the parochial school system when I was doing this, which was in the late eighties, early nineties. But then I went to start this new program and I was literally getting kids that like were cut from the football team and I was putting them on a soccer team, you know, on the soccer field, you know, and it was a whole new perspective right of the game and I maybe two kids that ever really played and then the other kids I just had to teach and I think that's always been uh you know I think a lot of this is from my dad you know just the challenge of teaching kids something new the challenge of because my dad coached sports as well youth sports you know and um, he was a factory worker and he used you know he, he also took the time to coach kids though in the neighborhood. And I think I, I took his lessons of, you know, can you impact others and can you, you know, just use sport for good. And so when I went to the public school, ended up primarily, you know, primarily being a better financial means for my family, but it ended up being another experience just because I got the opportunity to build a brand new program and to learn how to do that. And uh, it was really important for me, for my development. So you had talked about developing that program for several years. What did the program look like when you first got there to <laughs> when you left it off? No, it's great. Um, so when I first got there, we, we played in a high school football stadium. So the width was 55 yards. Uh, I was called a communist by the athletic director because I coached the foreign sport. Right. But what happened was that Indiana high school athletic association sanctioned soccer. So they needed to have a soccer program. So I was obviously that choice to coach because I had experience in it, obviously. So it went from, like I mentioned before, just taking kids that were, <laughs> that were cut from the football team or, you know, they, they wanted to do something in addition to cross country and, to uh, actually having a program seven, eight years later, beating a state ranked team and uh, actually the, the, net, the, the state champion runner up, you know, we beat them in a two, one exciting match. That's one of those games you remember, uh, uh, you know, just seeing where it came from. I, I remember I, I had my first two years there, three years there at the brand new program. Yeah. You know, I think the first year we won two games Second year, we won like three games, four games. Third year, we won like six or seven. But that fourth year, we ended up winning about nine or ten, I believe, and we were like nine and six or something like that. And one of the reasons why is because I had a group of freshmen, and there was like eight or nine of them, and they loved soccer. And they were like soccer junkies. Like they would go – on Friday nights and sneak into elementary school gyms and play soccer in the winter. And it got to the point where the athletic director called me in his office and said, Hey, you got to tell these kids they can't crawl through the window, right. At an elementary school to play soccer in the winter. I said, well, they could be doing worse things, you know? So there was this group of kids that 
eight or nine kids that kind of sparked everything for the next four years. And um, it was uh, it was funny when they were freshmen, they were beaten by a high school team like ten nothing. You know, and it was one of the biggest losses I've ever had as a coach. But when they were seniors, no, sorry, juniors, we played them again. And uh, we played them at their facility. And we were up 6 nothing at halftime. And the kids looked at me and they said, Coach, do you remember what they did to us when we were freshmen? And I'm like, yes. I'm like, I do, but I'll just say this. You're, you're allowed to score nine goals, but if, don't score ten. Because we could have scored, it could have been twenty-two to nothing, and so they they said, "Okay, coach," and and uh, you know it was just nice to see that, and and the crowd, by the way, was silent. They had no, I could hear the comments from the stadium, like, "Where'd this team come from?" Right, and it just it makes you feel good as a coach, right? That you develop these kids, you know, from just being has beens cut from the football team or whatever to competing and competing really well on the soccer field. And, um, and a lot of those kids got scholarships to play in AIA, to play junior college and so on. So that makes you feel even better. So moving on a little bit, I understand you coached one of our good friends, Andy McClasslin. So <laughs> did you see a coach inside of him or did you encourage him to coach in the future? You know, I don't, I, I think Andy was, was always just a really hardworking blue collar type player. I don't know if I saw a coach in him, you know, when he was younger, I just saw a really good person in him, you know, and, and I'm sure like what happened to me, it just, he just morphed into coaching. Right. And I'm really proud of, uh, of what, he, you know, what he's become and the young man that he is. And, and uh, you know, gosh, he's probably got some really good stories about me. Um, Cause my nickname used to be the Viper because I used to be like when I, I used to scream till veins would pop out of my neck and I look like a snake, but uh, I've calmed down since then. Uh, that's what experience will do for you. Uh, but no, I, I, Andy was always just a really good, hardworking, outstanding young man. And I, it doesn't surprise me that he ended up being a coach. So, How did you develop into coaching and education? <laughs> well, again, that's another great story uh, or great question, I should say. So I thought I was just going to be a high school teacher and a coach, you know, for my career. And unfortunately, I went through a life experience and I took a chance on being the state director of coaching for Tennessee youth soccer. So I left South Bend, Indiana to, to go to Tennessee youth soccer to be their state director of coaching. I ended up leaving there after three months because I needed to move back home to Indiana. And I became their state director of coaching. And I thought, okay, I'll do this for a couple of years. Then I'll go back into high school teaching and coaching. Well, I ended up staying in Indiana for 10 years. And then after 10 years, I did go back into high school coaching and teaching. And it was just weird for me because we didn't have virtual education back then. You know, we were, it was as a teacher, as a, as a teacher, you're governed by bells and walls when you're a high school teacher. I mean, you're literally timing everything, timing your bathroom break, timing your lunch, timing your, you know, and I taught in like four different classrooms. So I'm buzzing right from room to room to room. And I was like, okay, I don't, I don't like this part anymore. So I went back, uh, actually us soccer then asked me to work for them as a contractor and then asked, and basically they asked me to develop the F license, which was the coaching online coaching course for five to eight year olds. So I did that. Um, it was enough to make, you know, uh, you know, my ends meet. I also moonlighted for a club here in Indianapolis. And I, so basically I started in 2002 being a state director of coaching and I ended up working for U.S. soccer in 20, like 12, 2013, 2014. Did that for a couple of years and then I worked with Ian Barker. I asked, called Ian Barker and said, hey, do you have any openings or anything? So uh, just because my time at U.S. Soccer had come to an end because the F license was developed um, and they were moving in other directions. They wanted full-time people that could move. And I couldn't move because I have a family. So I'm not going to move my family to Chicago or Kansas City. I'm just not. So, um, you know, for, for family reasons. But 
So Ian uh, kindly brought me on his staff and uh, I've been there ever since. But, uh, you know, I started with the NSCAA, now United Soccer Coaches. Um, that was my first ever coaching course and it completely changed my life. It just like I had all this soccer knowledge in my brain, but I didn't know how to put it together in a practice. And that's what the coaching course taught me. How do you organize your soccer thoughts to make it into a meaningful practice? I've always loved education. I, you know, I'm, I'm a geek. I read those scientific articles and all that stuff as much as I can. And, and, uh, um, you know, now you just add soccer to it. It's just a wonderful win-win. How important is coach education and specifically grassroots development? Yeah, well, it's, again, a fantastic question. I, I think when you're a grassroots volunteer coach, you might know something about the game, but you don't necessarily know how to coach it and teach it, right, to seven-year-olds. So I think it's really important for those coaches and any coach in the grassroots or development stages to get some education because your words or actions can do a lot of damage psychologically to a child early on in their life. And last night I was, I was working with like 87 year olds, right? 87 and eight year olds. And it was like, and the volunteer coaches were helping. So I was showing an activity and then they would go do it. I was showing activity and they would go do it. But I, what I was hoping they would see is how I modeled, like, for example, acknowledging a player when they paid attention. Right. And, and these seven year olds would stand straight, you know, and then everybody else standing straight, you know, without yelling. I never, I never once really yelled or anything. Hey, stop. I think when it, when you're educated, you feel more comfortable. You feel like, you know what, I can get through 45 minutes because I know what to do. Right. As opposed to a coach that just reads something in a book goes on maybe what they think is right. And then they go on and they try and survive 45 minutes to an hour with seven and eight year olds. They struggle, you know, and those little kids will, they have no filter. They have no on and off switch. They just go. And if you're not prepared to manage them, it's, it's a challenge for you. It's exhausting. I, I was looking at the poor volunteer uh, coach last night and I said, God bless you. She just went, Oh, thank you. You know, because she was just, she was trying really hard, you know, and she had like 12 girls. And then, you know, there was another coach that was struggling with like 12 boys, you know, at a time, just one. So I told the, the club, I said, maybe you might benefit by giving an assistant to all these coaches, a volunteer assistant, so you can split the groups and help manage. But no, I think the more you're educated, the more you're more comfortable in the field, uh, the more you don't do anything stupid, <laughs> you know, and put yourself in a legal situation. I think, you know, if you're a club that your coaches aren't, don't have any education, I think you do open yourself up to if they do something stupid, uh, you can be liable. Your club can be liable. Education's really important, whether it's a two hour course or a four hour course, but just go get certified in some way, shape or form. So when you're out there, you feel again, just more comfortable, more like, hey, I can do this. I know these activities that I can do, right? And that will make the kids have fun. So, um, you know, last night, you know, a little seven-year-old came up to me and just gave me a hug. And she goes, thank you so much. I really like your games. And I'm like, oh, thanks. And so I, I didn't know what to do, right? Because we're in COVID and you're not supposed to like touch people. But she just hugged me. <laughs> I was like... You know, and that's the rewarding part, I think, you know, from being a coach. And, um, uh, but yeah, I think going back to your question, education, when you're educated, you're more, you're just, I think, more comfortable on the field than if you weren't, than if you weren't. Let's say you come across a coach that hasn't been properly educated and doesn't have the means to be properly educated. What might you say to them? Well, first off, you have to ask why are they not properly educated is because of money. Is it because of barriers? Is it because, so I would try and find out why, and maybe it's just because of time. Um, so I try and find out why, and then how I would try and help them is just offer my assistance. Cause I've found that, you know, with some adults, if you try and impose your will, they'll resist you. So offer my, my assistance, 
If it becomes detrimental to a child though, then you have to intervene obviously. But one thing I've been doing a lot is just creating little apps um, by, by using a program called Glide Apps. And it's just Google Sheets and it makes an app. And I'm finding out when I send them out to the coaches, it just gives them like little safe activities they can do in a pinch, you know? And I feel like, okay, this is better than going to YouTube and having them watch a, a video on how pep trains Man City and trying to do that with eight year olds, right? I'd rather give them an activity that they can use with eight year olds. There are coaches that resist education. I mean, I remember walking into a coaching course one time and the guy just said, I'm only here because my director of coaching told me I had to be here, you know, and you can't teach me anything. Okay. So, okay. That's, you know, you just listen to it and say, okay. Um, you can't help everybody is what I'm trying to say, you know, and, but at the end of the day, you just want to make sure that, that the people that you do help, you know, uh, glean from you and, and try and, uh, you know, just take, take the lessons that you taught them and, you know, and apply it on the field. So I wanted to ask a little bit about the woman representation in classes. I know some of the classes I've been to, I haven't seen many other women in the classroom. Mm. So how can we encourage more women to be involved? Uh, well, um, I, I think this could be one way, right? So I've actually started talking with uh, people from our women's advocacy group about creating a all women virtual course um so that way they don't have to travel we can do it you know through pre-recordings and this and uh, synchronous learning uh that might be one thing uh one way to do it and the other way is to basically just just keep encouraging them but you know there have been a lot of clubs that have a lot of organizations including ourselves that we've just had all female courses you know and it's true by the way anna at almost every course i teach there's maybe three or four female coaches, you know, in a class of like 36 people. But what I find is that they're the best coaches because they listen and they get it. They get child development. They get, they just do there. There's just, uh, you know, not that they're not competitive, they're competitive, you know, but they just, usually they end up being my best coaches. I think, you know, I think we got to figure out, new and unique ways. And this could be a way that we can start breaking down some barriers, having female instructors, for example, instead of me, right? It shouldn't have a bald head, you know, white head, white man, right? Teaching them all the time. It should be more female instructors, more diverse instructors, more. Yeah. Uh, so I, I just think that we just need to, to continue to work on that, continue to make strides. I know U S soccer is doing that. And I know we do that as well, right, as the best that we can. A lot of, you know, unfortunately, you know, a lot of female coaches, they're also uh, moms, right? So they gotta go home and help the home stay strong, right? Because we all know that behind every home, there's a strong woman, there just is, you know, just like behind every good man, there's even a better woman. One way that we're looking at it is to try virtual learning to try and break down any barriers or, you know, the way they have to travel or feel uncomfortable being in a group of 30 men, right. And you're the only female coach, right. Let's face it. You just don't feel comfortable. Going on with the virtual learning, how much have you seen virtual learning escalate or develop throughout COVID times? Oh, I, let's just say it's kept me up at night. It has exploded. I, I guess is the, it's unbelievable. Like we've started our blended courses and we already have over a hundred coaches signed up. Right. And uh, for our advanced blended courses, I just launched a high school diploma that's completely virtual. Um, we've had 33 people signed up in less than in a week. Right. So it tells me that the demand is really there, but I think people like to at least have a conversation with someone. Right. So that's why I think zoom or, and, you know, Google Meet and all those, I think they can supply that connection or that possibility of having a connection. Um, but I've seen, uh, I've seen it, yeah, just for our organization, it's really exploded. And I think the other thing it's helping is that hopefully it's keeping the costs down. 
right? So um, I, I know U.S. soccer. I know that they're they're basically doing stuff. They're going to do stuff like this to keep the cost of the licensing down. Our blended courses are like five hundred dollars less than an in-person course, you know, and it's it's wow, you know. And here we, you know, we Zoom or whatever. I should have bought stock in Zoom in March, but um, might be rich. But um, no, I, I think that uh, hopefully this doesn't drag on. But I do see this even after, you know, we this is all, you know, at least somewhat subdued COVID. That I feel like this is going to be a trend. That this is going to be the future, uh, mainly for costs and to also encourage, for example, female coaches and coaches of color and all that to be more comfortable in an environment. I, I'm not a big fan on just truly online learning. I mean, don't get me wrong. It's better than nothing. It's better than nothing. Um, and the, and the F license was completely online, <laughs> you know, and 98,000 people took it and hopefully it helped them on the field. But to me, you always have to have some sort of connection. Either it's a phone, even if it's a, a conference call, right, with a bunch of coaches. It's, it just helps because I know a lot of coaches, they'll, they'll watch a little video lesson. They'll be like, well, I still have a lot of – I still have a few questions. And it's, it's just nice to get on a Zoom call and speak with an instructor or a tutor. And, but I see this, is, uh, this isn't going away, what we're doing right now. Could you talk a little bit about the webinars that you were also a part of? Yeah, yeah. So when COVID hit – uh, hard <laughs> in March. Uh, my boss is like, all right, Vince, Ian Barker. All right, Vince, I want you to run two webinars a day. Um, and we're going to call it, we, we just came up with the title match day. Well, it was great at first. I mean, it was a lot of work. Don't get me wrong. You know, I, you were, you were great coming on and, and very, we're very thankful for you coming on. Um, but just, uh, lining up all the presenters and, all that, and because I had other things to do too, right? It 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 became quite a bit, um, but I've enjoyed them, I and mean, we've done over 150 of them, and I've really enjoyed every one of them because, on the other end, it, it, it's you, for example, and you're talking about what you do, and it might be an interview with Todd Yegley and Jerry Yegley, right? I mean, two just pillars of college soccer coaching in this country talking about their relationship and also like lessons that Todd learned from his dad, Jerry, you know, it just, I'll be honest. I mean, I've learned a ton myself just listening and, and uh, running them. But um, yeah, I mean, we try to keep them the 15 to 25 minutes, right? Like a Ted talk type thing. Uh, some people, we have a loyal following of about oh seven nine people, um, seven to eight people. Uh, and, but they're, they seem to come on now, since everything's kind of opened up, the numbers are going down and that's expected. And we also move the time because I also help at a high school team here in Indianapolis and our practices are four o'clock. So that's when we were doing them. Um, but uh, match day, I, yeah, no, I've really in love, love doing them. You know, I, I, I'm horrible at monitor, you know, moderating them. Ian's way more eloquent and he uses words like pithy and bespoke and mm -hmm. all those things. I can't, you know, I don't use those words and it's good to see my boss, you know, and because before COVID we hardly ever talked, believe it or not, even though we worked together, you know, so this has actually helped. I think that connection, you know, but uh, I tell you just the variety of speakers we've had on is, has just been a wonderful learning experience for me. Could you talk a bit about what you and Ian would discuss when you didn't have a guest or presenter? When, when Ian and I do get on and we don't have a guest, like, for example, we're doing one here in about an hour and a half. It's a new one called Two for Tuesday, and we're just going to present two activities that coaches can use. The other one we do are tactical scenarios and quizzes, which we get a lot of requests for the PDFs that I make for those presentations because I usually upload a PDF and we go through it. So those really, we've been doing a lot of soccer type conversations, right? Mainly just about the game um, and how coach, what coaches can do on the field uh, with their kids, but also how some ways that they can 
learn more about, for example, the game through tactical scenarios and quizzes. And we used to do two TGIF. Now we're, we're no longer on Fridays. Uh, we, we do um, a TGIF, almost thank God it's Friday on Thursdays. And those are meant to be more fun and light, right? Just 15, 25 minutes, just laughing. And we'll throw quizzes up there. And, and uh, you know, we've got a guy by the name of Ian Mulliner, who's one of the funniest men I think I've ever, you know, ever been around in my life. And he's a terrific educator and an, an even better person. Stephanie May and E. St. Jacob, wonderful people. And Samantha Snow, who's a queen, you know, down in Atlanta or near in, in Georgia. So we have, and then Ian, of course, is on as well. So it's like the six of us. And we just talk everything from, you know, we might have a quiz to what cleats did you wear when you were in eighth grade? You know, I mean, those types of things. And, and uh, it's meant to be fun and light and get people laughing a little bit because we're in a time where, uh, you know, a lot of people are going through depression, you know, and uh, I, I just felt like the, the, the match day, before the weekend, let's try and just make it fun and light to get people laughing again, you know, and, uh, and smiling again. So those are what we do when we don't have guests. So. Do you think after COVID there will still be so many webinars and education options online? I do believe educational offerings will stay. Yes. I, I don't know if there'll be as many webinars. Um, I, I think we'll continue to do Maybe, you know, maybe it's one every other week, right? A match day. Because I do think some people enjoy it, right? Especially that they love the tactical quizzes. They love the, the scenarios that we put on Mondays. We call it Monday management or Monday manager. But I definitely see asynchronous learning and synchronous learning opportunities continuing after COVID just because it helps costs stay down. It's a, we can, heck, we can have a class and, you know, with, whole bunch of people in, uh, you know, Guyana, the country of Guyana being on a zoom call. I mean, before you couldn't do that. So I, I definitely, now that we know it can be done, right. And I'm sure your schools would change too. I can see high, I can see education changing to doing what you're going through right now, for example, as a hybrid, um, you know, again, uh, it's going to help save costs. Um, I can tell you as a high as a former high school teacher, I don't know if I would like this, right? But um, because it takes a lot to plan a Zoom type educational experience, right? There's, there's a lot of prep work that goes before it and you got to keep everybody engaged and you got to figure out ways. You got to do these icebreakers. You got to do all these, hey, in the chat box, type this. But I just think that it's, I, I think that it's, just going to continue. I don't know if it's going to grow or get more. It might, but I just think it's going to continue because we figured out, Hey, we can do this and maybe we can get more people in the, you know, in a, in a course, right. And save them money on, you know, flights and hotels and food and all that. So I just think it's, uh, I think it's a, a trend that will continue after COVID. Before we wrap up real quickly, could you discuss what convention will look like this year? Well, I really don't know. I know Jeff Van Dusen's got it under control. He's the convention guru. Uh, it will be interesting. From what I understand, it's just going to be Monday through Friday. Uh, it's going to have everything from, you know, these types of presentations with some fantastic speakers that I can't announce yet, I was told, uh, but some really big time people and coaches, female coaches, men coaches, whatever, you know, international coaches. I think it could really provide an opportunity for people that normally couldn't attend the convention, you know, because of travel, because of costs, because maybe, you know, in Florida, I know in the winter they play soccer, right? So they can't leave their high school team to come to the convention. A lot of them can. So I think, you know, it, it, we might see an audience that we never got before. Um, which could be a good thing. I have one final question, which I ask every guest. What do you hope people remember about your impact to soccer and the world? I don't know. I, I guess my, my hope, my impact is that 
I just help coaches understand the importance they are to a child, right? And that they, they might be the best thing going for a child or for a teenager or for, you know, an adult, even, you know, a college adult, you know, a young adult. I hope that's my impact and that whatever, whenever I deliver a course or I talk, um, that it's more about, it's not, it's, it's less about you as a coach and how victorious you are on the field. It's more about the little victories you make off the field. And I hope that's my impact and that people say, you know, that when I, you know, and I told my wife, I want to be cremated, you know, I don't want to be buried, you know, and, uh, um, I hope people say, you know what, he was a really good educator, you know, and, and, uh, modeled it every day as a person and a human being, you know, I, I do hope that they, they say that right when it's all said and done, but, uh, I hope that's my impact and that I help coaches help people get better and help, help coaches that have a heart that help players that need heart or that need a heart. Right. So that's what I hope my impact will be. This past weekend consisted of two full days of soccer on the field. I was refereeing with not a lot of break time. So my muscles are definitely feeling it today. It was really neat to see on the field. So many female coaches, there were, there were female coaches coaching female players, but also coaching male players. And this is something that Vince and I talked just a little bit about. Vince is someone that is very passionate about keeping women involved in the game and just continuing education for women and for anyone in general. I know convention this year will be a bit different, and we talked a little bit about that, about what it may look like, but this is a great opportunity for people that may not be able to make it to convention to get the for education that they may need. So I hope you're able to stay involved in the game during this rough time. And I hope you enjoyed the episode. Until next time, remember to keep the game beautiful.